This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top questions and things you struggle with most so you can have more energy and less decision fatigue about what to eat, how to move, and you can change your thoughts to Flip 50 with the life and the energy you love in this second half. And one of my all-time favorite guests on a hot topic for our Flipping 50 community is back with me on this episode. He's talking about a topic we all care about today, metabolism. He's got a resource I'm excited to share with you that you're going to want to get your hands on. Dr. Alan Christensen is a naturopathic endocrinologist who focuses on thyroid function, adrenal health, and metabolism. He has been actively practicing in Scottsdale since 1996 and is the founding physician behind Integrative Health. He's a New York Times bestselling author whose books include The Metabolism Reset Diet, The Adrenal Reset Diet, and The Complete Idiot's Guide to Thyroid Disease. Dr. Christensen regularly appears on national media like Dr. Oz, The Doctors, and The Today Show, and now we can include the Flipping 50 show in that group. (laughs) Dr. Christensen, thanks so much for coming back. Hey, Deborah, super glad to be with you again. This should be a lot of fun. This is going to be great fun because we had so much positive uh, comments and questions come in actually as follow-up from our last episode on Adrenal Reset that I know this is going to be a big one. So the M word, and we're not talking menopause for a change. (laughs) Oh, I can't wait. So the book, first of all, Metabolism Reset Diet Book, loving that, comes out when? That'll be January 29th. So awesome. All right. That's a perfect time of year because we are all thinking about it. <laughs> so what inspired this? I mean, I know you're you're the thyroid, you're the adrenal expert. What inspired this book? Yeah, that's a super important thing. And I guess it was like the core part of my personal journey that brought me to be in the health space rather than you know astronomy or something was trying to manage weight and then looking at thyroid health, focusing on that clinically and endocrine conditions. What I came to see was that it's always been my audience's biggest struggle between weight and energy. And it's almost like there's a trade-off. I think like weight, energy, and appetite, you know, and I think everyone has figured out that if they cut out uh, this food or if they drop their food by this percent, that they can make some dent in their weight. But once they do that, they don't feel well. You know, their energy often tanks. And for a lot of people, their appetite just goes in a bad way. They get cravings and they want more. And, and on the other hand, they've often tried to just eat clean or focus on organic or eat more intuitively and When you do so, you can get a lot of good foods in and you can feel energized and often have good control of your appetite, but it tends not to help the weight. And I've heard a lot of folks tell me that they try hard to eat clean and their weight keeps going up. So it wasn't just a matter of how can you starve, but how can you change your body to where the energy and the weight and the appetite to where they come back into balance again with each other. That's a pretty awesome solution. So the book has done that? Yeah, we've done clinical trials on this and it's in the body's potential. And like everything, here's the thing, everyone has some metabolic flexibility. We never get exactly the amount of food that we need for a given day. It's just, it's just a matter of how much extra you can have and still use it in the future as fuel rather than store it as hard to access body fat. And then if you've got a little bit less, can you function well and not be exhausted and have cravings? Everyone has some flexibility, but it's often far too narrow. So it's not really like speeding or ramping the metabolism. It's making it flexible again. So love that. So of course, you know, you know what I do. So my question is, do you talk about exercise in the book as well? I do. And this is, this is bizarre, but I think about like, what what it takes to fix something may be different than what it takes to maintain something. So, you know, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and had a big fall. And so when Humpty Dumpty fell down, you might need super glue to put him back together, right? 
But when he's back on the wall, you might just need a seat belt to keep him there. <laughs> but <laughs> so one thing I really want listeners to think about with the book too is to change the mindset to not not that a healthy way of life should necessarily lead to weight loss because weight loss is a very artificial state for the body. So the habits that serve you well to keep you lean and energized and feeling great may not be the habits that work for weight loss. So in the book, I encourage lots of great, healthy exercise, lots of variety of that for weight maintenance for people. But some who have had struggles with weight loss do better taking brief periods of time with less exercise during a low fuel state. Yeah, no, totally agree. Oh, gosh. You know what? And I think uh, that that will totally be our meme for promoting this episode. The habits that keep you lean may not be the same ones that help promote weight loss. I love that. You know, I've been on a personal struggle. Uh, it was really bad as a kid as far as just, just weight, but I've had a lot of times as an adult to where it's been difficult. And, and <clears throat> there was one window in my life in which I was a competitive cyclist. And getting into this, I was I was seeing the schedule my coach is putting before me, and I was moving into a state where I was training for about 25 hours a week. And every hour was a tough hour. It was like hard, hard training. And I thought going into that, Deborah, that – shoot, I've got to refuel, but I won't have to worry about my food intake now with, you know, putting out literally sometimes like 20, 30,000 extra calories a week. I thought I want to eat whatever I want. Guess what? I gained weight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, I totally get you. <laughs> I totally get you. Ironman training is the same way, right? It, and, and or marathon training, you know, it's, People often think, oh, you know, that's a great reason or excuse, or I will lose weight while I'm doing this. It's like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who is the metabolism reset diet for? Well, it's for the person to where they've very specifically, what I talk about is height to waist ratio. So mm -hmm. when someone's waist circumference is more than half of their height. And when they define this in medical research, it's the belly button. And to be really precise, you wake up in the morning, have a bowel movement if that's your time of day, uh, empty your bladder before you have any food, stand up, take a deep breath in, let your breath out, don't hold your tummy in, just let it relax, and then measure with a tape measure around your belly button. As adults, most of us know our height. If you've not measured for a long time, maybe you've changed a bit, but just take, take your height in inches and divide that by your waist circumference. And if the number is, uh, if your waist is more than half of your height, then that's what this is about. Um, people think about weight as being a struggle. And for many, it is in terms of just we categorize overweight or obese based upon height and weight. But there's many people to where their weight may be where it's supposed to be per the tables. But there's too little muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So that's where we see that better with that height to weight ratio. Great comment. And so we're really kind of getting into this distinguishing the difference, which is a hot topic. I, I talk about pretty frequently BMI or body mass index versus are we talking about body fat yeah. to lean and, and there being such a difference, but you're also talking about something uh, something else or additional, there is that visceral body fat. Yeah. And there's even a deeper layer. So fat comes in like three, three types in the body. There's the subcutaneous fat, and that's the stuff that's right below the skin. Pinch and um, inch. This is a, huh? Pinch and inch. Pinch and inch for sure. And this is a funny little nerdy aside, I guess. But do you know that we're the only non-aquatic mammal that has subcutaneous fat? Otherwise, it's yeah, it's us, it's dolphins, it's whales, it's porpoises. But if if Fido gets fat, you know, Fido's skin is still right against Fido's bones. But there's just a big belly beneath it all. But no, we get subcutaneous fat. But we also get the visceral fat that you mentioned. And what this book talks about is like that next level called the organ fat. Uh -huh. And this is the most deadly of all. I mean, seriously, like the amount of uh, like two grams of organ fat, which is about like the mass of a paperclip, if that's in your pancreas, you're now diabetic. 
Or you could think about like 30 grams of organ fat, which would be about like, boy, like a, about a golf ball weight or even, even less than that. If that much is in your liver, that can, that can create fatal cirrhosis. So this organ fat is just incredibly relevant to health. I'm sorry, this, this, yeah, but within the organs. Yeah, definitely serious. And there are a lot of people walking around with that. I mean, is, is there an estimate, you know, of, of how many of us have that? Well, whenever we see height to waist ratios off, that's usually why. So the, the main variable that affects waist size apart from subcutaneous fat is, is fat inside the liver. You know, it's, it's not just a thing over on your right side of your abdomen. It's across the whole abdomen. So, so Deborah, there's a disease called fatty liver syndrome. Mm -hmm. And it's something to where it's not an all or nothing. It's really on a continuum. And some versions of it get so bad, they get diagnosed. But most people, it, it's never been diagnosed. Um, you can test for it by blood tests or by ultrasounds or by biopsies. And you, you never do a biopsy for a screening test. And that's, however, the only way you know for sure that someone does not have fatty liver. So the only circumstance in which biopsies are done to healthy people is when they're potential liver donors. So say I had a brother that had liver failure and I was an eligible donor for him, I would have to go through a lot of hoops to make sure that I didn't have a liver infection, that I wasn't on medications, that I wasn't diabetic, that I had normal liver blood tests. And if I passed all those hoops, the final step would be a liver biopsy to make sure nothing was wrong with any liver tissue that I would give him. And in situations just like that, when healthy people that have no signs of liver problems, when they have biopsies, over 40% are found to have fatty liver disease. Hmm. Wow, that's a significant amount. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go back to something you alluded to a little bit earlier in talking about kind of the the commingling, if you will, of your weight, your energy, your appetite. Yeah. And, and there are a lot of people who want to lose weight and a lot of people use a diet, you know, or some kind of a temporary change to do that. But a lot of people really feel poorly while they're dieting. Why is that? Well, so let's think about this. You're, there's not there's not enough energy available, and that sounds obvious. But when the body works right, that shouldn't be such a trauma. So every pound of fat is about a day or a couple of days use of energy for most of us. And when the liver works well, and when it can burn fat for fuel, then it just supplies that. And you know, healthy people are still hungry, but they function pretty well, and they're not. It's not catastrophic for them. Your liver stores energy in two ways. There's uh, glycogen and there's triglycerides. And so what happens when there's too much, too much waist circumference and early versions of this fatty liver, then the body cannot tap into energy stores because there's too much triglyceride and not enough glycogen. So that, that's why when someone's a dieter and they feel terrible, well, their, their body can't make energy any longer. Wow. Okay. Good. All right. So you've got a term you also use called metabolic flexibility. Define mm -hmm. that. Yeah, for sure. So if, if um, today I did a run this morning and I'll do a hike here in a little bit and I've eaten food throughout the day and, and let's say that I didn't get enough to, to function. I had a little bit, a little bit, I missed a, had one snack was too small or something. So if I had a flexible metabolism, my liver would draw out energy to supply for that and I would feel fine. And on another day, let's say that I didn't do, I wasn't very active, but I still ate as much. If I had a flexible metabolism, my liver would store that extra in ways that were pretty harmless and easy to tap into. But when someone loses metabolic flexibility, any time that their food intake is above some threshold, even by a small amount, it leads to weight gain that's hard to reverse. And the other scenario is that any time that their food intake is below some threshold, then their energy levels just plummet and they have cravings that show up. So, so everyone has a certain range of flexibility, but for many people, it's far too narrow. They don't have enough leeway in that. I'm suspecting that this liver is either a friend or a foe, depending how could, how could the liver block 
fat loss? I mean, is, does it tie right back into that triglyceride piece? Well, the liver, ultimately, it's always a friend. It's trying to adapt to a bad situation. So we think about like a great example. Part of the story could be insulin resistance. So the body makes itself block insulin, and that prevents fuel from coming inside the cells. Now, that's only good when that's an act of triage. You know, it's only good to ignore someone who's, who's bleeding when someone next to you can't breathe. You know, it's, you've got a triage, and that's, that's what your liver is doing. So when it can't process any more fuel, it stops your body from processing fuel, and it just shuts everything down. The reason it does that is because if you forced fuel inside the cells when they couldn't tolerate it, they would die. And when too many of them die, we cannot function. So it's, it's not good to be unable to use energy. And it's not good when we have versions of energy like glucose and triglycerides and cholesterol all floating in the bloodstream but not being burned. But that's less harmful than destroying the cells. Got it. All right. So this makes me kind of in this contemporary moment we're living in where, where it's the, the keto diet, it's the paleo diet, it's the vego diet. Look, <laughs> looking at vegan or keto, it, why can they work even as contradictory as they might be or, convert, or um, controversial? How can they both work in the short term and do they work long term in your opinion? Well, yeah, in the short term. So I think about food as having various things that it has to offer for us. And one of those is it's fuel, like gases to the car. Food is also building blocks, proteins, you know, from proteins and amino acids. And then food is micronutrients. Then food is some phytonutrients. But as far as the fuel side goes, so many of our symptoms and our health outcomes are just based upon that fuel load. So fuel collectively can be thought of as the combination of fats, carbs, and even, even ketones. Um, alcohol can also act like a fuel in ways that are more harmful. But for many people, if they drop their fuel load, that alone can be a healthy thing. So if someone was on a processed food diet and they had a lot of junk carbs in that, and they went paleo or keto and cut out their junk carbs, and if they didn't radically raise everything else, well, now they're eating less food <laughs> because you can't, you can't change one part of your diet in isolation. I mean, let's say you went gluten-free. Well, either you just didn't replace that food. Now you're eating less food or you replace it with something else. Now you're eating a new food. So you can never change just one thing. But all those diets, when they work, they become low fuel diets. And they often don't work in the long term because it's just hard to have um, a lot of exclusion, but also because many people start finding ways to either they, they're not as strict as they were at first, or they find ways to raise their fuel load with the new rules. You know, if you have too much fat on a keto diet, you won't lose weight, you'll still gain weight. And if you're vegan, many will have their weight really plummet, but there's plenty of unhealthy things that can, Oreos are vegan, <laughs> you know, and, and, and paleo, same thing, you can do that in a way to where there's too much fuel coming in. So I always try to think about what's what's the most important variable. And people didn't go keto, didn't lose weight because they lowered their carb intake. It was because they lowered their fuel intake. Great thoughts. Yeah. And I think that's really something that, you know, listeners, I would highly recommend you hear that the first time. And you might want to come back and, and listen to that again in the past because there's really a lot of in-depth information there. Well, and along those lines, too, the, the macronutrients if we have them in from a lot of food categories with a lot of variety, that's really how we supply the micronutrients and the phytonutrients. So all parts of the diet are, are useful in their capacity. And if we get too narrow and too strict, like for even, even in the body, things like insulin are quite important. So if we make insulin too low by eating no carbohydrate, that stops our liver from activating thyroid hormones. It also stops our liver from making glutathione, one of our important antioxidants. So we really need all the parts of our diet in some degree. Truth. Yes. Okay. So how is the metabolism reset diet different from, and, and I'm asking you to kind of come back to the same topic, but can you compare and contrast how it's different from just caloric restriction, just simply cutting down, doing a math 
or yeah. intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. For sure. So caloric restriction, and, and you can you can lose weight by lowering calories, but that's why I talk about waste as the real outcome that matters. So I mentioned how carbs, fats, ketones, they can all act like fuel. Protein's a little different. So the metabolism reset diet, it intentionally creates a low fuel state short term, but it maintains a, an amount of protein that can prevent muscle loss. So yeah, protein has some distinct roles. And it's, you know, I joke with people that if, if weight loss were all that matters, you could just tie enough helium balloons around your belt and you would achieve weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's, that's really not the goal. It's about changing, changing the waste and changing the overall system. And intermittent fasting is more about the timing, the timing of the food. And it's, it still comes down to how, how much food there is and how that fuel of food is relates to the overall protein status. So they've shown that when it comes to weight loss, the timing of food is not the variable that matters. You know, those who lose weight on intermittent fasting are those who consume less food. Hmm. And if it's just less food, you can run the risk of muscle loss if it's not done in the right way. Mm -hmm. Such a great point. And how important while somebody is doing, say, the metabolism reset is specifically not just exercise, but resistance training to prevent that loss. It's critical. And actually, we've got two things that people well, have you done. Can just, Jim wasn't stop and repeat that, please. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, seriously, super important. And especially after about the first week or so. So in the, in the metabolism reset diet, I encourage, even though there's very little exercise during that stage, I st I'm still encouraging some, some micro workouts. Mm -hmm. and Everything we said about the liver, Deborah, believe it or not, there's fatty muscle syndrome as well. And many of the same things occurring to the liver are occurring to the muscle. So you want the muscles to be activated and stimulated because that way they are more able to assist in regulating the body's fuel balance and a good variety of types of, I can like, you know, cardio and strength training and flexibility, almost like protein, fat, and carbs. Like the you macular know, you need, mm -hmm. you need all these things and they're all just essential for good health. So true. So true. So bottom line is we need a healthy liver. Yeah. And the exciting part is if someone's not having their appetite, weight, and energy line up where they want, they can come back to that really quickly. You know, the liver is one of the most resilient parts of the body. So just, just a few weeks even, you can get it to where you've regained a good amount of that metabolic flexibility again. Fantastic. And within the book, I'm just guessing, fingers crossed, is there some programming so someone can, can read it and jump into a program? Or is there something else that you're offering? There sure is. And this is something that we started using in the clinic for reversing diabetes and reversing fatty liver. And we had such consistent good results. Deborah, I've had countless stories to where someone, um, A1C score, some of your listeners may or may not know, but that's one of the ways we define diabetes. And healthy people are around five. Diabetics are those who are above 6.4. Well, diabetics who are 11 are in severe danger. And I've had many stories of diabetics who are 11 or 13 on their A1C, and they're on three, four medications, and we stop their medications on day one and go on this 28-day challenge for them. And at the end of it, they're no longer diabetic. We've had scores of examples of this. And what happened was that it was rather smooth and not a difficult process. And our staff started doing that just to drop some inches on the waist. I'm like, hey, this is a great way to do that. And so then we started using that for other purposes, and it became very popular, and we saw in which it was a successful way to have a big decrease in waist size that would last and stay off. Fantastic. So exciting. And I mean, the fact that you can regenerate and rejuvenate in such a short amount of time to this, our, you know, immediate gratification kind of society, <laughs> great news because a little then success and feeling good feeds into the rest of your life coming around too. All right. Most difficult question of the day by now, you know how this is going to roll, but what question should I have asked you that I didn't? Hmm. 
Yeah, I guess, I guess for the listeners, um, yeah, just, just a sense of what, what it can be like afterwards and how things can change. And, and, and that's, that's what I'm probably the single most excited part is about telling people that there can be life beyond dieting, that you don't have to live your life as a dieter, that it's, it's not, it's not fun, but it's not effective. So it, it isn't a matter of you not trying hard enough or that you didn't find that one sneaky evil food that was still on your plate. It was, it was never that it was that your body wasn't able to regulate things properly and it was doing its best. It was keeping you safe. It would have been more harmful if it didn't do that, but you can shift and that can change and you can get it to where you've got some metabolic flexibility again. And it's still something to where we've always got to think about eating well and moving our bodies and doing all the right things, but you can get it to where a lifestyle that has been enjoyable and reasonable to where that works for you again. You know, I I think back to, um, for me, it was a long time ago because my first struggles came along as a kid, but there was a time in which I played when I wanted to and I ate what I wanted to and I thought about none of those things and they all lined up. And that's where people should should plan to, to plan to be. That's what they should be shooting for. They should settle for nothing, nothing less than that. That's completely possible again. And, you know, one thing I want to point out, kind of piggybacking off of that, I think you've said it without saying it. So you've said, you know, if you're essentially done with dieting, you know, it's not a fun way to live you know, and getting back to really not having to think about it, but kind of to go one step further, maybe into the positive, when you really enjoy food, and I know what a great cook your wife is, (laughs) but it's a big part of our pleasure in our culture as well. And shouldn't it be right? Yeah, there's, there's no, there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to enjoy, enjoy our food. And, and, you know, we want to eat well and focus on including a lot of good things, but it doesn't have to be a matter of a moralistic decision or a puritanical decision. There's times to where if we were to have, if we were healthy and stable and we had a few bites of a dessert or a food that we thought was, you know, the, the, the not, not the popular food of the day, if that's a small percent of things on occasion, that, that doesn't harm healthy people. You know, we, you can see that we even, even the worst ways in which foods can affect some people, they don't affect everyone in those ways. So the question is not what is the good or bad food, but the question is how do I get it to where I can have a relationship with a, with a variety of good foods? So good. So good. I'm so excited for the book, The Metabolism Reset. It's released January 29th of 2019. Where is the best place for listeners to find that and to get more Dr. C. You know, the book will be wherever books are sold. Um, all things Dr. C are at drchristensen.com, dr and christensen.com. And we'll have the book there as well. But yeah, all bookstores will have it. Fantastic. And listeners, I will link to the book to the website. And by the way, if you're listening and committing it to memory, that's Christensen with an O-N, S-O-N, And I will also share all of Dr. Christensen's uh, social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, super active and super generous with the tips that he shares. So you're going to want to get the book. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Always always fun to hang out, Deborah. Listeners, if there's a question that I missed that you still have, you can leave it below the show link for this episode at flipping50.com forward slash metabolism boost and join us on the flipping 50 tv facebook page to get all of the juicy resources and the links that we mentioned in the show notes and again that's flipping 50.com forward slash metabolism boost and if you enjoyed the show please leave a rating in itunes it really helps us spread the word and then share this with a friend to surround yourself with a supportive community of women on the same journey. What are you waiting for? Start flipping 50 today.